for inviting me this evening. Um, you might wonder why this topic of epileptologist is going to talk about, but that's because my first point I was a behavioral neurologist, and still most of my research has something to do about behavior and cognition, even though it's wrapped around epilepsy. <clears throat> so, for those that don't know about the brain, the average brain weighs about three pounds. It has a hundred billion neurons, nerve cells. Each of those neurons has 7,000 synapses, connections to other neurons, giving us about 7 trillion synapses across the brain. Extremely complex organ, the most complex organ in the body by far. It, uh, it works by electricity and by neurochemical transmission. And uh, we have not understood it very well. In fact, for a long time, humans didn't even understand the brain was important. And even though the ancient Greeks had kind of figured it out, we see remnants in our language today about the heart being the seat of the soul. Um, in, in February, we celebrate by setting out little red hearts, and every neurologist knows that they should be a different shape. But that's not where all this emotion comes from. So my talk today is going to be about how, a little bit about uh, the beginning about how we have learned about how the brain works. But it's mainly focused predominantly on effects of focal lesions as opposed to degenerative dimensions, which is a different kind of talk, which is a uh, slow degeneration of the, of the processes. Here we're going to talk about focal lesions and then what we learned from that about how the brain works. So to show how much trouble we had figuring out the brain, and we still don't know a lot about it. Here's a, a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci in honor of the Leonardo series. Now, we all know Leonardo was a fantastic artist, and he understood anatomy very well. So why would he draw this drawing with three little ventricles in the middle of the brain? There aren't three little ventricles in the brain. There's actually four ventricles that don't look anything like that. The reason he drew this, it was a cart. The inside part of this is a cartoon. He's showing a theory. A theory that was present for over a thousand years. People thought that all the thoughts and emotions and memories had to do with the fluid in the vesicles. And at one point, this took up this, the, the concept that the bodily humors went in the back ventricle, the visual humors went in the front ventricle, and they mixed in the middle to make memories. That's how far off we were. We're probably that far off today in some ways. In the 19th century, there was a big movement called phrenologists, and they would fill the box on your head, almost like a fortune teller, and tell you what, what your abilities were. Uh, there were ones for wit and love of family. They varied by different phrenology schools. This particular one I found on the back end of it, something was surprising. It was called uh, Sexual Love. And I thought, ah, oh, when I was a teenager, I was feeling all the wrong places. <laughs> or at least trying to. But by the end of the century, the famous Spanish scientist, Cahill, had discovered a silver stain and could see the neurons. He could see that it wasn't just a globus mass. There were individual elements there. And people started to think about how these individual elements worked. And they looked different across different parts of the brain, how they were organized. And they thought, well, maybe they, different parts of the brain do something different. Now, remember the phrenologists. One so their theories was that if you had a big forehead or big bulgy eyes, you would be very fluid. You had good fluency, verbal abilities. So that leads us to Paul Broca, a French physician, who knew this theory. He was looking for a patient that had a frontal lesion because he thought if they had a frontal lesion, they would have trouble talking, but they wouldn't have trouble understanding. And lo and behold, he came across Monsieur Louis Le Bon. Monsieur Louis Bon was in the hospital for many long, long time. In those days, they didn't have rehab units. They didn't have nursing homes. He had a series of strokes, probably from syphilis. And he was in the hospital. And, and Paul Broker met him shortly before his death. And here was a man who had a clear problem with speech output. The only words he could get out were tan tan. You'd ask him, how do you tan tan? What's your name? Tan tan. That's all he could say. But he could understand very, very well. You could do complex commands and things. So it was a perfect patient. And when he died, Broca had him autopsy and took his brain and on the same day took it down to the anthropology society to present this case and say, aha, he has a frontal lesion and, that, and that's important for speech output and that's why. Uh, he never had the brain cut. It actually got lost in the Second World War. It was hidden in the basement of the hospital. 
and people forgot where it was, only to be discovered about 30 years later. And they took the brain by itself and put it in a CT scan, and you can see this big hole where the, where the stroke was. And it actually was much bigger than what we call the Broca's area today. The hole on the outside is Broca's area, but it goes real deep. So the deficit he had was more than just purely the Broca's area. It took about four years, and they started seeing more cases, and they all were coming up on the left side. And Broca finally went, ah, we speak with the left side of our brain. So that was the first indication, if you, unless you get into historical controversies, of a guy named Dax who had actually written a thesis about this beforehand. But it's in the 19th century, no doubt, and started to understand for the first time that the left hemisphere is very important for language production. About a decade later, a fellow named Carl Wernicke, famous for a whole variety of kind of things, described a case of a hole back in the back end of the brain, farther back. And this patient was kind of the opposite of Broca's patient. He could speak very fluently, but couldn't understand a thing. So if you listen to a Broca patient talk and you ask him, tell me you went to the store and bought bread, you go, what store bought bread? With a partial Broca kind of a face or expressive patient. The one key patient, and the, the Broca patient would understand if you said point to the door after you touch your nose, they could do that. The one key patient couldn't do that. But the Wernicke patient was fluid, but if you asked, if he was trying to tell you what the story about bread, he would, he would talk like, what the ribbons I can buy from bread and stuff, he's like, it would be gibberish or mixed use words in, in that kind of disorder. And so we started to find the area between that, along the psyllium fissure on the left, is a very important area for speech. This left perisylium fissure, fissure is very important. It's probably about 90% of humans have the language organized on the left around this area. The rest is mostly bilaterally distributed, and it can normally be bilaterally distributed. But remember I said it doesn't work as just one point in space. The brain doesn't work as a global mass. It doesn't work as individual little uh, clumps. You take out broken air and stick it on the table, it doesn't work. It doesn't generate fluency. It's a network. It's a network system, so it has features that look like it's kind of global. It has features that look like they're local. And so here we have an experiment visualizing this for the first time in the 1970s from Sweden. And they give a radioisotope and they have the people read silently or read aloud. And you see Broca's, you see Wernicke's, you see the face area, you see these frontal area, the SMA is important for sequencing. And you see a difference here in the mouth area because you're reading aloud. But you also see more activation here in the uh, Wernicke's area because you're reading aloud and you're monitoring that as, you, as you're talking. Here's another example from that, that experiment. This is speaking with your eyes closed. So the visual association cortex that we saw back here a while ago is not activated, but we see big activations in the whole perisylvian region there. But that's the left. What's the right doing? It's activating on the right. Why is the right activating when you're talking? Because the right does other things for language. It doesn't do the propositional <coughs> aspects of, of what the meaning of the words is, but it listens to the tone and interprets the tone. It speaks out the tone of the words. It's, and when you get a right brain leash, and you can get a condition called aprosodia. This was not recognized until the late 20th century. So for example, if I told you, I want a million dollars, and I asked you to tell me, how did my voice sound? If you had this disorder, you'd go, oh, you're happy, you want a million dollars. But in fact, the voice was sad. And so understanding those tones and voices is a function predominantly of the right brain. What else? We didn't understand that. What, what, how, what did we think the right brain did before the late 20th century? Well, if you look at writing, scientific writings in the middle of the century, the 20th century, they called it the minor hemisphere or the non-dominant hemisphere. And while it's not dominant for language, the left side's left language, it's the language dominant for left side, the right side is dominant for other things. So if you get a big stroke like in this CT scan on the right brain, what deficits do you have other than your left arm gets weak? You get problems with visual spatial processing, so you can't draw a clock and put the numbers on the face of a clock. You can't copy complex figures much of it, and you can't copy even simple figures because you have this problem of processing. So the right brain has the ability to look at across space 
and process things as a whole. One differential has been not that the left is language and the right is visual spatial, but the left is sequential processing. I'm talking right now, you listen to one syllable after another, you're processing all that sequentially. Well, the right processes things holistically. So if you came into a room and you wanted to find where you left your pen, if you're going to use your left brain, you'd be going, each, you had to check each thing sequentially. The right brain, you walk in, you look around, pen. You find your pen, you pick it up. Because you can pull all that in. And so it, what, it's, what it's dominant is, is in directed attention. And the sine qua non for the deficit when you get a big right brain lesion, similar to aphasia for the left brain, is a thing called neglect syndrome. This is a disorder where you can't respond or uh, perceive uh, into the space opposite the stroke, so it'd be your left body or left any space. And you can't explain it by just because you're blind on your left side or just because you can't feel on the left side. It's more than that. So this, this is a disorder of perception to the left space. And one of the theories about this is that each hemisphere kind of predominantly activate processes opposite space but that the right brain can process the both. So when you get a left brain lesion, you get a patient, but you don't really get neglect. But when you get a right brain stroke, you can't process the left space. And therefore, you get neglect of the left space. Here's some examples. They get a very strong eye deviation to the right. Your arm is weak. And the most profound thing about it is that you ask them, are you weak? They say, no. You take their arm and stick it in front of their face and say, whose hand is this? And they go, that's your hand, doctor. Now, if I hit my computer with a hammer, it'll, it probably won't work process very well, aphasia. But if I hit my computer with a hammer, it's not going to deny some of its keys. That's a very human characteristic and very unique. What else do you get? You get this, here you're supposed to make little X's out of each of the lines. So you put it in front of a patient, and they X that out, and you say, you done them all? You sure you got them all? Yeah, they all, I x them all out. They can't even perceive these things to the left side. You ask them to draw a flower. They just draw the right side of the flower. That looks like a flower to them. It looks symmetric. It looks fine. Because they're not perceiving the left side of the flower. Even remarkably, this perceptional problem of space goes into their memories. So in the 1970s, Biziak, who's a neurologist in, in Milan, reported these two patients. There's a big, if you've ever been to Milan, there's a big, beautiful cathedral there and a giant piazza in front of it. So he had patients who were in the hospital, not at the piazza, in the hospital. They had a big right brain stroke. He had them stand here at the bottom of the piazza looking at the cathedral. And he says, what shops, what things are in that piazza? And they would name stuff over here. Then he said, OK, now in your mind's eye, pretend you're standing on the steps and look this way. Now what do you see? And they would see things over here. A few years later, I was working down south in Georgia. And uh, I wanted to see if this, we could find this and, and extend the experiment. Now, in Georgia, as you may know, there aren't many piazzas. But there is left and right, sometimes too much right. And um, we, I had two patients. One had a central porch, like a shotgun house. And I asked him to pretend he was back home standing on the porch and name the rooms in the house. And he only named rooms on the right. And I said, OK, that's it? All the rooms? Yes. And we'll walk around the house and pretend you're looking in the back porch. And he named rooms on the other side of the house. Another patient did the same thing when I asked him to pretend he's standing on one end of the street for the other person the other end of the street. He would name things predominantly to the right side rather than to the left side. He was neglecting his mind's memory, spatial memory. And even more remarkably, if when we were asking these questions, if we had them look to the left or to the right, there was a difference. If they looked to the right, they did worse remembering things to the left. When you had them look to the left, they would remember more things looking to the left. So even your the facial eye gaze and head movement activates the hemisphere off to the opposite side. Because you turn and look that way from this side, it activates that brain a little bit more. And so they could do a little bit better if they activated that look that way. In, in memory, for, in spatial memory for something in their mind. Another bizarre syndrome that we see sometimes, it's rare, is called prosopagnosia. We've known about this for a long time, but only in the last 20, 30 years we started to understand how it happens. And the patients get lesions at the bottom of their temporal lobes on both sides, sometimes just on the right side. 
and it envisions 2020. It didn't get the visual tracks, but this is an association uh, processing area. It's very important for facial recognition. And so everybody looks the same. They can see there's eyes and nose and ears, but they can't recognize them. Sometimes patients with this, can, they can recognize their spouse's voice. They can even recognize their spouse walking, but they can't recognize their face. So they use tricks like the wear a red carnation when you come to pick me up, which is fine unless somebody else has a red carnation on. Very bizarre disorder. If, if think if you were a scientist in the 19th century and some, I mean, a doctor and a patient came in and said, the family said, you can't recognize faces, you would have thought that God was probably psychotic or had a psychiatric disorder. There was a real disorder there. Now, if any of you have ever read on the web about memory, you probably came across this patient, H.M., who just died a few years ago at the age of uh, 82. His real name was Henri Gustave Mullison. He lived in uh, New England, in Connecticut. And in 1952, 53, I'm sorry, he had surgery by a surgeon named Schofield. And Schofield was a psychosurgeon. He did a lot of frontal lobotomies, and he's trying to make the lesions less uh, severe. And so he restricted, he tried to cut other areas to see if he could get the improvement in psychosis without uh, causing the patient to be so blunted as happened with the frontal lobotomies. And so he did a bilateral, he did bilateral amygdaloid activities. You can see the holes right here in the mesial temporal, inside medial temporal lobe, that's where the hippocampus is. That's a very important area for memory. We didn't know that at the time. He was doing this on schizophrenics, and because they were so psychotic, he didn't notice they had memory problems. Turns out, uh, Mr. Mollison had epilepsy. He was not psychotic. He didn't have psychiatry problems. But uh, Dr. Schofield heard about other surgeons like uh, those at the Montreal Neurological Institute doing focal triple lobe surgery for epilepsy. It was very successful in the 40s and 50s. And we still do those today. It's one of the most common epilepsy surgeries we do. So he thought, well, I can't localize which sides or not, I'll just cut both of them out. Because I've been doing this surgery in the schizophrenics. And lo and behold, poor Mr. Mollison developed the most profound anterior grade memory disorder. He could not learn anything new. His parents died. He couldn't know that they died. He would tell him something, spend hours, they'd come in and spend hours testing with him, go out for lunch, come back, he'd never recognize that you, he didn't even met you before. That profound. He couldn't learn some things. He could learn motor skills like, like maybe if you were learning to play tennis or, or learning to uh, play a video game. They didn't have video games there, but something like that. He could learn those things because those kind of memories were routed and learned in other places. But for his whole life, he couldn't make new memories in that regard. So we, for the first time, we understood how important this area is for memory formation. And people started to be more cautious about, about cutting out the temporal lobes. And even today, you can get along fine if the other one's good, but if you accidentally cut up one and the other's bad, you're in big trouble. Even one side, it's, it's a problem sometimes in, in a drop. You don't become anesthetic like that, but you drop your memory. And so today, we're doing things to reduce that, like using smaller lesions by a laser, or uh, putting electrical electrodes in those areas and stimulating them to stop the seizures. The frontal lobes are the largest extension evolutionary-wise in the, in the human brain. It's the largest lobe, and ironically, probably the least understood, I think, in, in regard to what it's doing. And maybe that's because it developed later. It's kind of laid on top of those other old brain functions. And, and maybe they're like subroutines, if you're thinking like in a, in a computer. The irony is that one of the most earliest reports about focal brain lesion and that's clinical syndrome is in frontal lobe lesions, separate from motor areas, which are at the back end of that pink rib area. There. That's where the motor strip is. And you, if you lesion that, you get weak on the opposite arm. We understood that, but as you move forward, in the frontal lobes, our understanding of it is very, very poor. So I'm going to tell you a story about a, a patient that you probably heard of if you know anything about frontal lobes, and about a country doctor that only wrote two papers in his whole life. The patient is Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a foreman for the railroad. They, they were building a railroad in Vermont through a pass. Now this is uh, early 19th century. And how did you build a railroad in the 19th century? If you, railroads have to be fairly flat, they can only go up so 
much braid or they just slide back down the rail. That's why you have paniculus when you have a steep grade. If you have a rail one, you got to flatten the grade. They didn't, so how did they do that? They didn't have dynamite, they had gunpowder. So they drill a hole in the stone, they put pack it in with gunpowder, they covered it with sand, pack it down, and then they would put a fuse in it, light it, and run away. After it blew up, they come back with picks, axe, and knock all the stone away and tote it off. It was very hard work, but this was the big industry of transportation of, of railroads. So Phineas was doing this one day up in the mountains of Vermont, and he got distracted by using this big tapping rod that you poke down in the thing, and he looked away and it hit the side of the stone, it sparked, lit the the gunpowder, and boom, this big rod went right through his head and out the pocket, and out the top of the man about 20 yards away. He was knocked out, and he woke, woke up, and he survived this. And the first paper was about him surviving this. And it's a pretty gory paper about, uh, about uh, all the infection. And, us, and they didn't have antibiotics. And his brain herniating out the top. And he survived all this. And it was really remarkable. And he kept in touch with his family. Uh, and some years, Phineas Gage could never go back to work. His personality had changed. He, uh, wandered around, he had different jobs, he ended up in Chile for a while, and then he came out to California. And he worked out here, uh, had taken care of horses. And he died here in San Francisco from epilepsy. He, had a, he developed epilepsy, and then he had a prolonged seizure and died from that. Here in San Francisco, he was buried here. And because uh, Dr. Harlow had kept in touch with his family, he was able to convince the family and the mayor of San Francisco to have the body exhumed and the skull was shipped back to Harvard Medical School is still there today. So it's the first thing we understood about somehow this frontal lobe lesion alters your personality. And about in the late 20th century, we got some additional cases started to understand better. This is one from Iowa, from the Dimaschios, with a guy that had a big frontal lobe meningioma the size of a softball. And after his, he'd been a very successful accountant, very a married man, uh, very prudent, uh, very trustworthy, and after this happened, he got divorced in six months, married some woman for six months, got divorced again, got involved with shady people, lost his job, lost his money. He was completely impaired to make decisions, and yet he lost his disability because all his, the standard neuropsych testing, from memory, language, all this stuff was intact, but he could not make decisions. To, he could tell you judgment-wise what you should do in the abstract, but in the real situation, he could not Perform. You couldn't even make a decision about where to go to eat or these kind of things. Completely, life completely decimated. Another author, uh, Dr. Lamy, who's the grandson of a very famous neurologist from the 19th century, uh, he worked at the Salpetriere in Paris. He wrote these papers about environmental dependency syndrome. He had a series of patients with frontal lobe leases. He showed they couldn't disengage themselves from the environment. So. If you shook your finger at them, they shake their finger at you. And the one on the right, the glasses were there on the table. The doctor picks his own glasses up, puts them on. The patient's already got glasses on his head, but he picks up the glasses and puts them on his face. The doctor combs his hair. He doesn't really have any. The patient has no hair at all, and he's going to comb his hair anyway. The doctor smells a rose, uh, the flower, the doc the patient smells a, smells a flower. They kind of respond to what's going on in the environment there. And uh, so this ability to disengage yourself and make judgments to avoid it, uh, that's maybe a function of the frontal, frontal lobes in large part. And certainly making social judgments and those kind of things are important. And in closing, I just mentioned the, the concept of what, what has the, how do we have consciousness, how do we lose consciousness. We are far from understanding this well, but we do understand lesions that cause this. You either take out both hemispheres of the brain, or you take out a central core. The central core includes the thalamus and upper membrane. So recent research suggests it's either the upper membrane by itself or a combination of upper membrane and thalamus. And so these areas are critical for consciousness. If those are severely damaged, then you would never expect the person to recover from, from, the, uh, from the damage. As opposed to when you hear these, read these case, rare cases where someone wakes up after a decade, it's because there was no lesion in the brain, and certainly not a lesion in those regions. And uh, there's a lot of ongoing research about consciousness. 
But that's pretty complex, and I'll leave that for another lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>